welcome to module 2 so in this module we'll talk about the properties of mixtures especially talking about solutions and colloids now let's start with the contents here so in this lecture we'll talk about the types of solutions how the solutions are framed due to intermolecular forces and how intermolecular forces connect biological macromolecules such as proteins and other molecules into solvents such as water and why substances can dissolve and understanding how solution generally works and we'll also discuss how solubility can be described as an equilibrium process finally we'll talk about the concentration terms colligative properties of solutions and finally we'll end with the structure and properties of colloids so let's start with the sol difference between solutions and colloids so simple sense a solution is a homogeneous mixture meaning that the final the final mixture that you get exists as a single phase so which means here that the particles in a solution are individual atoms, ions are really small molecules. Now a colloid is a heterogeneous mixture and it generally exists as two or more phases which may be visib visibly distinct. So in a solution you cannot visibly dist distinguish between the two parts of the mixture but a colloid you can actually visibly see the difference between the two parts of the mixture. An example of a solution is for example, uh, you can say sugar water. So when you add sugar into water, you'll notice that it's a clear solution because the sugar molecules will try to uh, bond itself and form a solution in a single phase. So they exist as a liquid phase. But a colloid, an example of a colloid is an emulsion. Uh, an, emulsion an emulsion is simply a paint if you can think about it. Or if you pour sand into water, that can be expressed as a colloid. So if you take the example, the appropriate composition of a bacterium, you'll notice that the water takes about 70% of the mass, while ions constitute 1% and sugars constitute about 3% and amino acids contain about 0.4%, lipids 2%, nucleotides 0.4%, other small molecules as 0.2% and proteins, nucleic acids and polysaccharides constitute about 23%. Now remember here, the understanding is that all of these are being dissolved all of these are dissolved in the main consider main uh, in ingredient that is water so this compose this is the composition of a bacterium in general and this is how you look at a solution next let's discuss the difference between solutions and solubility so how what is a solution in general so a solution is a combination of a solute plus solvent solute plus solvent so a solute in general gets dissolved in a solvent to form a solution. So in simple sense to remember this, so solvent is the bigger of threes, so is the most abundant one and solute is the small quantity one. So what is solubility then? So solubility of a solute is basically a characteristic of a solute that says that this is the maximum amount that can be dissolved in a fixed quantity of solvent at any given temperature. So at a given temperature, the amount of solute that can be dissolved in a solvent of a fixed quantity is called as solubility and substances that exhibit similar type of intermolecular forces dissolve in each other. Remember that like dissolves like. So which means the type of forces that are involved characterize the type of uh, solution that can be dissolved in a solvent, solute that can be dissolved in a solvent. For example, the, these are the five types, six types of intermolecular forces in solutions. The first one is the most common one that you see, ion dipole forces. For example, when you mix salt into water, this is an example of ion dipole forces. Hydrogen bonds is when you mix two polar solvents, so two polar substances. Dipole dipole forces, again, two polar substances with hydrogen bonds and this is just polar substances without hydrogen bonds. Next we have ion induced dipoles. This is an example where an ion induces a dipole in a non-polar molecule. So this is an example of an ion non-polar forces. This dipole induced dipole would be a polar substance and a non-polar substance. And finally dispersion forces are generally forces between non-polar substances when both the solute and solvent are both non-polar. Now let's talk about the solutions and intermolecular forces. So when a solution generally forms, we talk about solute-solute attractions 
that are there present between the solute molecules and the solvent solvent attractions between the solvent molecules are replaced by solute solvent attractions so this is the primary source of formation of a solution so this is the primary force for the formation of a solution so to form a solution you have to replace the solute solute attractions and solvent solvent attractions with solute solvent attractions now provided this can only occur if the forces within the solute and the solvent are similar to the forces that replace them for example if you mix a polar substance with a non polar substance so polar polar forces and non polar non polar non polar forces are different so to have a proper bonding or to have to form a proper solution the forces have to be replaced so that the it's easier to replace so forces that are similar to the original so if you, if it is polar polar forces it's easy to replace a polar polar force with a similar one that trip, that uh, shows a polar polar force so an example of this would be to take the example of uh, the hydrogen shells that form on around ions when you mix for example uh, any ionic substance in water so when you mix an ionic substance in water so you have a positively charged ion here surrounded by the negatively charged oxygen molecule of the hydrogen molecules remember that the forces between these molecules are hydrogen bonds but these hydrogen bonds here are being replaced by ion dipole forces because the forces are nearly similar so they they can be replaced easily so ion dipole forces orient these water molecules around an ion and in the innermost shell here you can see that there are six water molecules five and six there are six water molecules that surround the cation in the form of an octahedral structure now let's talk about some some solutions that can have what we call dual polarity so dual polarity is a molecule that can act as both polar and non polar so a best example of these is alcohols alcohols are these organic compounds that have dual polarity so dual polarity means they can act as polar and non polar so they get they are both polar and non polar substances at the same time so when you take the general formula of an alcohol you'll notice that there's a carbon chain attached to an oh group so the oh group is the polar part and the carbon chain is the non polar part so the oh group being polar can form hydrogen bonds with water and can form weak dipole induced dipole forces with hexane the same other part which is the hydrocarbon portion is non polar so it can interact with weak dipole induced dipole forces with water and through dispersion forces with hexane so there is a difference levels of polarity based on the molecules carbon chain and the oh group that is present so for example when you take methanol methanol has high solubility in water but um, really less solubility in hexane the main reason is because the oh actually dominates the forces here the same thing happens with ethanol and propanol ethanol and propanol are two substances that actually have infinite solubility in both water and hexane but as you increase the number of carbon chains so the the higher the number of carbons it automatically decreases the solubility in water so when you increase the number of carbons it decreases the solubility in water because the the increase in carbons results in an increase in dispersion forces so rather than having the hydrogen bond forces or the induced dipole forces dominating so dispersion forces will dominate resulting in lesser solubility in water so remember this principle always that like dissolves like so it's easier for methanol to dissolve in water than for example say hexanol to dissolve in water so let's try and predict the relative solubilities between the molecules here so the first one they asked is sodium chloride to be dissolved in methanol or one propanol so notice that sodium chloride is an ionic molecule so when it splits it forms na plus and cl minus it's easier for this to form an ion induced dipole ion dipole forces with methanol than ion induced dipole forces with propanol because there is varying levels of forces so it's easy to dissolve in methanol the reason mainly is because methanol has a larger oh attraction than influence of ch3 forces but propanol has more uh, at more uh, dispersion forces in comparison 
next one is ethylene glycol in hexane or in water so when you think about ethylene glycol here notice that there are two OH groups so because there are two OH groups, it can easily form two hydrogen bonds so here hydrogen bonds will dominate so which means that it would dissolve better in water than in hexane remember that even though there are two carbons dispersion forces are really weak in comparison to hydrogen bonds so hydrogen bonds take over the substance resulting in higher dissolution in water next we have diethyl ether in water or in ethanol remember that diethyl ether there is only one way for it to form a bond with water the only way that we can think of is hydrogen bonds but it does not form any hydrogen bonds so it cannot mix easily with water but the carbon parts can easily undergo dispersion forces with ethanol resulting in the formation of resulting in higher solubility in ethanol so this is how you can judge the predictive predict which solvent a particular solute will dissolve better in so use the same principle now pause the video right here and try to solve these problems next let's go into the correlation between boiling point and solubility so the one thing that you would notice is that as the solubility increases you notice that the boiling point also increases so this linear this relationship here is best described by the type of molecule that the solubility itself can result in higher boiling points the main reason is because the higher the solubility the higher the chances are that the molecule is uh, forming a stronger bond so it takes a large amount of energy to break that bond so this is the reason why you notice that as the solubility increases there is an increase in the boiling point next let's take a look at the arrangement of atoms in solid solution so this is an example of a solid solution so a solid solution basically is called as an alloy an alloy is a combination of two different metals so there are two types of alloys a substitutional alloy and an interstitial alloy a substitutional alloy if you take brass so brass is a molecule that is comprised of zinc and copper so what happens here is that the zinc molecules basically replace the copper molecules in the copper so if you take pure copper so the zinc molecules are taking place of uh, taking the places of copper so they are substituting copper with zinc so this is an example of a substitutional alloy next one is an interstitial alloy interstitial alloy is an example of this is carbon carbon steel so carbon steel what happens though carbon steel is a common compound that's commonly used in uh, uh, high strength uh, applications and high uh, rigidity applications where you would see uh, tools uh, are generally made of carbon steel so here this is an example of what we call an interstitial alloy so what is an interstitial alloy so when you see arrangement of molecules you notice that there are gaps so these gaps are called interstitial spaces so if the molecule that is mixing here occupies that intermolecular spaces where iron is present so this is iron so between iron molecules if the carbon is taking the interstitial spaces between the iron molecules we call that an interstitial alloy this is an example of an interstitial alloy so these are examples of what we call solid state solutions next let's discuss the next concept how intermolecular forces can make biological macromolecules dissolve in water so intermolecular forces also play a really key role in determining the structure and function of biological molecules so there are there are two key types of interactions that we that we have to know first one is the polar interactions and ionic groups that attract water but you also have non-polar groups that do not second you have distant groups on the same molecule attract each other in the same way that different groups of molecules do so an example of this would be to take the example of an amino acid in an amino acid you have one of 20 different side chains where you have an alpha carbon but you have a amine molecule on one side with a positive charge and a negatively charged molecule on the other side where the oxygen is present this exact this is a molecule we call it a zwitterion so zwitterion is a molecule that has uh, an overall charge that is balanced by the molecule 
So provided even if they have the charge, but if you take the overall charge, the molecule has zero charge. But remember that it still has a charge internally inside the structure. This is an example of a sweater ion. Next, let's talk about the peptide chain here. So when you take the peptide chain, you notice that you have glutamic acid, which has a negative charge here. You have serine, which is neutral. You have another carbon chain that is having a positive charge here. And you have the peptide bonds. Notice that these combinations of peptides, peptide bonds are generally made up of structures that have zeta ionic structures that have negative and positive charges. Now, what are the types of bonds that make the make up the protein structure? So, for the pop, so if you think about proteins, how are they in that shape? The shape is due to the presence of the forces, intermolecular forces. First forces that you will generally see is the hydrogen bonds within the peptide chain. Notice that the peptide chain itself is made up of C double bond O NH. So C double bond O NH. So this is an example of a peptide molecule. But notice that here the hydrogens themselves can bond with a lonely oxygen here with a lone pair. So resulting in the hydrogen bonds within the peptide chain. The second type of forces are the ion dipole forces that are formed with the zeta ionic side structures of proteins polypeptide chains and water and the third one again you have hydrogen bonds between the OH groups and water you have hydrogen bonds within the peptide chain you have salt links and you have disulfide bonds so disulfide bonds is an example where you have two sulfides so this is one of the bonds that you will generally see in organic chemistry when you go into organic chemistry you will see that some proteins contain sulfurs at their end so we call them thiol thiol molecules or thiol ends of the polypeptide chain so we'll see those structures as we go along there and internally you also have the dispersion forces that will dominate the structure and these are all the forces that combine to give the protein its unique structure so without these intermolecular forces proteins would be just would just be uh, structures uh, structures with any uh, without any purpose so these uh, structures that they form actually make it make it their purpose creates a purpose for those molecules another example of these molecules would be the cleaning ability of soap so when you take a soap molecule a soap molecule is basically a long chain fatty acid which is a non-polar end and a polar end on one side so the this is the non-polar end and this is the polar end so when you take up grease molecules or anything that's attached to oil, so they, they get attracted towards the non-polar end. So what happens then is that these molecules get surrounded by the non-polar end and on the polar end, the molecules, the molecules that are there are water molecules. This result in pushing these non-polar ends away from the water, resulting in the formation of a shell. So what happens is that all the dirt get, gets trapped like this resulting in a uh, shell here the shell here contains the grease or any strains that that are present and the outer shell makes it the outer polar for polar molecules which are water basically push them to create that shell structure resulting in the removal of the molecules here so this is a best example of the cleaning ability of soap that depends on the dual polarity of these molecules another example of this would be the membrane phospholipids present on your cells so present on the cells, these membrane phospholipids actually separate the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. So they separate the intracellular and extracellular fluid resulting in it's the separation of the internal molecules and the external molecules resulting in the creation of the sodium potassium concentration gradient so to keep that concentration gradient alive cells actually use these membrane phospholipids as their main source so the membrane phospholipids contain a polar ionic head which is the phosphate head and you have a non-polar tail which is a fatty acid or a lipid so this is how your uh, cells look like. Remember that non-polar generally get attracted to non-polar. When you cut away the channel proteins on your cells, you will notice that the outside structure 
is filled with non-polar protein uh, pep peptides resulting in attraction force between the uh, phospholipids and the proteins to, for the protein channels to work so you need polar molecules to enter so the internal part of the protein channel proteins are generally coated with polar regions resulting in this formation so whichever generally has to be held by the surface generally contains a st stream of non-polar regions and whichever is outside the structure is generally made up of polar regions so it's a series of polar and non-polar regions that di that dictates the formation of cells so another example of this would be the antibi antibiotic gramicidin a so antibiotics work in such a way that they create a channel protein inside the membrane structure of bacteria so they generally create a membrane protein here so once they enter this structure they disrupt the sodium potassium pump so they disrupt the sodium potassium gra concentration gradient so once the sodium potassium concentration gradient is gone so the automatically the cell will die so if there is no normal balance of sodium potassium concentrations automatically the cell will start undergoing cell death so this is the action that antibiotics generally take in so this is the common action of most antibiotics in general so this is how they can kill a bacterium next let's talk about the short portion of the polynuclear chain the nucleotide chain of dna so dna is made up of a base uh, sugar and you have a nitrogen base with a phosphate group attached now the sugar the bases and the phosphate group automatically create the series linkages the linkages again are made up of either uh, bo covalent bonds or hydrogen bonds but to create the double helix structure it needs something else so that something else is the atgc bonds so if you take about atgc these are the your uh, these are your four bases that are present in your uh, dna adenine and thymine generally have two hydrogen bonds that make the structure on the two sides of the double helix structure gc contains three hydrogen bonds that make up the double helix structure and to keep it intact you have also have ion dipole forces with water you have a non polar interior inside the molecule which is made up of the atgc compounds and a polar ionic exterior so the polar ionic exterior is generally made up of phosphate so phosphate groups which make up the outer exterior and the interior is made up of non polar uh, non polar interior molecules which are made up of atgc attractions which result in the hydrogen bonds between the structures so this is the way in which intramolecular forces can make up large biological macromolecules next let's talk about solvation and hydration so what is solvation so solvation is the process where a solute particle is surrounded by solvent particles in water this process is called hydration so remember this process hydration hydration is when the solute particles are surrounded by solvent particles so this process is called hydration so the heat of hydration or the heat of solvation is the heat of solvent plus the enthalpy of the mixture so in water the heat of the solution the enthalpy of solution is the sum of the enthalpy of solute plus the enthalpy of hydration so the hydration of an ion remember is always exothermic because remember that the ion dipole forces are generally very strong so when you have m plus or x minus when you mix it in water it forms m plus aqueous or x minus aqueous so this heat of hydration of the ion is always less than zero so enthalpy components in simple sense how do you look at it in terms of the uh, ex exact structure let's look at let's take a look at exothermic solution and an endothermic solution in an exothermic solution first we are going to start splitting the solvent molecules up into individual solvent particles and then again the solute particles we are going to split them into individual solute particles finally we have the total heat required for the both the solute enthalpy of solute plus enthalpy of the solvent finally when you mix them together what happens is that you have the delta h of the mixture 
In an exothermic process, this delta H of the mixture is the greater than the solute plus solvent, the enthalpy of the solute plus enthalpy of the solvent. And this delta H of the solution is basically given by, is always going to be less than zero. The reason, the reason mainly is because here it's a exothermic process. So because here it's a exothermic process. In an endothermic process, delta H of the solution is greater than zero because it requires more heat from the formation of the solution because it's endothermic. Now, whenever you have an ion, remember this, this is just for an ion. For ions, it's always exothermic. Now, let's take a look at trends in the heat of hydration in for ions. So the heat of hydration of an ion depends on the charge density, which is basically the ratio of charge to volume. Now, the higher the charge of the ion and smaller its radius, the closer the ion can be to the oppositely poled H2O plus molecule and stronger the attraction. So the, the charge density and the heat of hydration decreases as you go down the group and the charge density and heat of hydration values increases across a period. The reason it decreases down a group is because the atomic size increases. And even though the charge stays constant, the size increases, but here the size actually decreases resulting in the formation, uh, resulting in increase in charge density and the heat of hydration. So this is a table that shows uh, different ionic radii and the heat of hydration. Notice that as the size increases, as you go down the group, you notice that the size increases automatically, the heat of hydration gets decreased. Now, how do you calculate the enthalpy diagram or how do you look at a case of an enthalpy diagram? Let's take a look at three different uh, molecules. Let's take a look at three different ionic compounds when you dissolve them in water. First, you have salt. So for it to form a solvent, first it has to dissolve completely. First, it has to split into the individual ions. That energy for a source, for a solid is the lattice energy. So lattice energy is basically the energy required to form it into a solid. So first that energy needs to be added so, so that it can form ions. Second, it starts splitting and undergoing hydration. So where the water molecule surrounds the molecules resulting in an aqueous formation of the molecules. Now, it creates the Na plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. Finally, you have a heat of solution which is 3.9 kilojoule per mole. Here it is positive. Remember that here, in salt, it's actually an endothermic process resulting in a heat absorption from the surroundings into the solution. Next, you have NaOH, caustic soda or sodium hydroxide. Again, lattice energy, it splits into Na plus and OH minus. Finally, the heat of hydration when you add it into water. Now, this here, the value is negative, resulting in negative 44.5 kilojoule, which results in a heat uh, release from the solution into the atmosphere. And finally, you have ammonium nitrate. Again, ammonium nitrate finally results in a heat of uh, solu enthalpy of solution, which is about positive 25.7. So this is also going to be absorbing heat from the surroundings into the solution. Now, let's try to understand this uh, diagram and let's try to solve a problem. So with secondary applications from sedatives to fire retardants, you have calcium bromide, which is primarily used in concentrated solution as an industrial drilling fluid. So from the table and the lattice energy of 20, 2132 kilojoule per mole to find the heat of the solution, find the heat of the solution of the calcium bromide. So they're also asking finally to draw the enthalpy diagram for this process. So first thing that we need, remember, is that we need to know the delta H of hydration. So delta H of solution is delta H of the lattice plus delta H of hydration. So delta H of the lattice plus delta H of hydration of the ions. So for first, let's try to find the delta H of hydration of the ions. So delta H of hydration, you have calcium bromide, so which is CBr2, which is going to be calcium 2 plus and 2 Br minus. So you have one calcium molecule and two bromine molecules. So you have the lattice energy, which is given as 2132 kilojoule per mole plus 
the heat of hydration of ions first we need delta h of hydration of calcium plus two times delta h of hydration of br minus so we have 2132 plus for calcium from the table the value is minus 1591 so you have minus 1591 kilojoule per mole plus two times what is that a bromine so for bromine the value is minus 284 two times that of minus 284 so that gives you 2132 minus 1591 minus 568 so let's try and uh, use a calculator you have 2132 minus 1591 minus 568 so that results in a value of minus 27 kilojoule per mole so the key to the solution I'm sorry delta h is solution is minus 27 kilojoule per mole so which means that this is an exothermic solution so the exothermic solution basically means that this releases heat into the surroundings so that is the idea behind the solution here now how would you draw the enthalpy diagram here based on the values that we get here so first we have let's take in two levels here first have the ground level energy now you have the solution right here first it releases an energy into the surroundings so first it has to take up the lattice energy to create calcium and bromine ions finally the heat of hydration and finally it creates the solution that you need so let's write it down you have ca br2 solid that creates ca2 plus and 2 br minus as gases so this is delta h of the lattice next you have delta h of hydration which basically creates ca2 plus aqueous and 2br minus aqueous so this finally the heat of the solution the heat of the solution here is this energy so that energy here is the heat of the solution which is minus 27 kilojoule per mole notice that it's below the original level so it's below this level so which basically means that this is exothermic so this is how we know that whether a solution is exothermic or endothermic. So use the same principles now. You have the value here. Pause the video right here and try to solve this problem. Next, let's talk about solutions and entropy. So the entropy of a system is generally related to the number of ways a system can be dispersed, can disperse its energy so therefore the freedom of its particle so the higher the freedom the higher the entropy so in simple sense if you look at it gases generally have the highest entropy of all the three states of matter but a solution also has a higher entropy in comparison to any pure solvent or solute the reason mainly is because we are disturbing uh, equilibrium a freedom of the solute and solvent we are dispersing it into a single single solution resulting in more entropy and more freedom for the solute particles and the solid particles so remember that an increase in entropy is always favored in both physical and chemical processes let's take an example of uh, mixing salt and hexane when you take salt and hexane so hexane requires a really small amount of uh, energy to separate but it requires a large amount of energy to separate nacl into its individual quantities but the entropy of the mixture is much smaller than the entropy the enthalpy of the solute because of this reason and delta h of the solution being much greater than zero which means that this is highly endothermic 
which means that this will never happen so there is no dissolution so there is no dissolution of NaCl in hexane next one is if you take hexane and octane you have hexane and octane requiring similar amounts of energy to be separated but when you mix them together the amount of energy of the solution delta H of the solution is nearly equal to zero but they do mix the main reason is because the enthalpy of the mixture is much greater than the enthalpy of the solution so because the enthalpy of the mixture is much greater than the entropy of the mixture is much greater than the enthalpy of the solution this is one of the reasons why it mixes really well in the solution next let's get into the topic of solubility and equilibrium so a saturated solution is that there are two types of solutions in terms of their equilibrium a saturated solution unsaturated solution and supersaturated solution what is a saturated solution so saturated solution is the one that contains the maximum amount of dissolved solute at a given temperature in the presence of undissolved solute so this is the maximum amount of solute that can be present in a given solution so the undissolved solute in equilibrium with dissolved solute so the undissolved solute will undergo an equilibrium with dissolved solute and anything you add more than the in anything you add into a saturated solution will become undissolved so it will not undergo any dissolution if you add more solute into already saturated solution next one is a saturated solution a saturated an unsaturated solution generally is the one that contains less than the equilibrium concentration of the dissolved solute so which means that if you add more solute it will dissolve so if you add more solute into a saturated solution it will become undissolved if you add more solute into an unsaturated solution it will dissolve so what happens in a saturated solution is that all of the molecules are surrounded by their hydrogen shells and there is no mo no molecules left for any other intermolecular forces so any other molecules left of the solute particles will try to precipitate and create so will precipitate and get on to the bottom of the solution go to the bottom of the solution now the next type of solution is what we call as a supersaturated solution a supersaturated solution is the one that contains more than the equilibrium concentration of the solute but this is a state where this is un un unstable and whenever you put any disturbance into the medium it can cause the solute to crystallize immediately this is an example of a supersaturated solution so a supersaturated solution is the one that has more than the equilibrium concentration but because of its unstability any disturbance in the medium will cause the excess solute that is present to crystallize immediately next let's discuss the factors that affect solubility so there are three main factors that affect soluble two main factors that affect solubility first one is temperature so whenever you have more solids they become more soluble at high temperatures gases become less soluble at temperature higher temperatures the main reason is because solids generally tend to increase in their entropy resulting in more dissolution and more easier uh, because they can split into their intermolecular forces are broken at high temperature so they become more soluble but gases because of the random motion they become less soluble at higher temperatures the second one is pressure so pressure affects the solubility of only gases and it becomes more soluble at higher pressures so this is a graph that shows the solubility with temperature you notice that with salt there is not much change in the solubility but as you noted for the other materials like for example potassium nitrate has very high solubility as you increase the temperature but there are other materials like heavy metal sulfates which can cause decrease in the solubility as you increase the temperature so most ionic compounds are more soluble at higher temperatures now the effect of pressure is one of the important parts on gas solubility so think about it in terms of the avogadro law so let's say you have gas molecules with a liquid as you put more and more pressure you are basically causing the gas molecules to collide more and more with the liquid as it increases collisions with the liquid it becomes more soluble because it collides more therefore results in more uh, dissolution into the liquid so this is one of the reasons why there is as the pressure increases the gas solubility will also increase so the law that relates solubility to partial pressure of a gas is henry's law so henry's law basically states that the solubility of a gas is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas above the solution so it's given by solubility of the gas equals 
kh times pressure of the gas kh here is called as the henry's constant and it's different for different gases so let's take an example and let's try to use uh, this principle here and solve this problem so you have the partial pressure of carbon dioxide gas inside a bottle of cola is 4 atmosphere at 25 degrees centigrade what is the solubility of carbon dioxide so the henry's law for carbon dioxide dissolved in water is 3.3 times 10 to the power negative 2 mole per liter atmosphere at 25 degrees centigrade so we know the partial pressure of co2 which is 4 atmosphere and the value of kh so we just substitute it which is kh here times so this is kh times the partial pressure of the gas so the solubility of co2 becomes 0 0.1 mole per liter in cola so use the same principle now pause the video right here and try to solve these two problems in the next lecture we'll continue our discussion on concentration of concentration terms and colloids colligative properties and colloids so with that we end